Yeah. Every kind of one can hear me now. So, as David said, my name is Henrik. I work for a startup called Wrap. And I will be talking about refactoring in the structure. And what I mean with that is basically how we work with the Wrap app and generally how we work with the code of uh, And I'm going to put, uh, start going from some basics and then I'm going to show you the code and show some libraries that we use. Uh, I'm going to assume that you have some Android development experience. Uh, just too much. Uh, but if anything is unclear, feel free to drop me at any time. Okay, so first some background about RAP. Uh, RAP was started in early 2011. Uh, we started out by doing digital gift cards. So if you use RAP, you can enter the app and then send free gift cards to your friends. Uh, and what we really were was a marketing platform. So those free gift cards were an incentive that you could get from your friends so that you would go and shop at different retailers. Uh, recently, we actually changed this strategy a lot. First, we went to becoming more of a shopping application, uh, but now we're doing something not completely different, but different. Uh, so we're uh, launching our own card, and so we have a card in the app, and we'll be able to with you with the offers that you deserve. If you want to know more about that, you can go to app.com slash next to see what we do and also sign up for the data. Uh, but technically, as a company, we are mobile first. We have a native Android app and a native iOS app. And the uh, uh, most important for this course is the Android app, which was created for Android 1.5. Uh, and it was a, a complete clone of the iOS app, as many Android apps are uh, And I can say that we still work in the same project today. Uh, and that might sound terrifying, but it actually works quite nice if you follow some basic guidelines. Uh, we work in a startup environment, which means that we have a lot of things to do. We don't, or that, uh, we don't have that many people to do them, and our time is very limited, uh, both how much we can develop the features and until our money runs out. And everything is always changing. It's, it's a lot of restraints on the code and what you can do and what you can't do. Uh, so, the approach that we have to our code is, uh, the first and most important thing is that uh, you need to take your time to reflect with this. Uh, and that's why we've been able to keep the same project through this time. Uh, we have always taken time to reflect to our code. Uh, and that's the base of having all code maintainable, basically. Uh, but I also want to say that you shouldn't reflect on things just because you want to reflect them. Like, you can have a really ugly activity that works and you have that in your app. Don't go, you just go there and reflect it because you don't like the code. You should have some kind of incentive of refactoring it. And for example, if you're changing the loading in one activity and you need to unify over all that, um, by all means, go and refactor that other activity. Uh, and then one thing, I can say that all of these things seem very clear when you talk about them, but when you're sitting there developing, they're not very clear. But the next thing is you don't need to completely change something. And what I mean by that is that in our case, we had our API uh, library that we put wrote from scratch for Android 1.5 and optimized it for Android 1.5. And then a little bit uh, later, we wanted to change something more to use. We wanted to introduce Wally into that. And we started off by trying to change everything to Wally, so every network call and everything. And that created a lot of bugs and, yeah, then we couldn't work it uh, at the later stage. Uh, so instead, what we did was that we introduced the Wally base and all new features that we created, uh, we created with Wally. And then slowly over time, we were using Wally and all that. Uh, that's not completely true because we also really like the Wally also doing the things that we wanted to use with Shimada and the So there are many benefits of introducing something, start using new features, and then slowly and uh, migrate to so. And then the last point, which a lot of people have talked about today is uh, the way that we did it before two weeks ago. We focused on Android 4.0 and made everything compatible with Android 2.3 and up to API 8 or 9. And it worked quite well to work that way if you need to. Uh, um, but you have to set some the main rules. So, for example, if you want to support, or in our case, you want to support API 8 and up, and then we said that everything below Android 4 they should be able to use that, and that's the 
then on Android 4, you know, and it should be nice, it should be nice, it should be a really good experience. So that's the requirement we said. But two weeks ago, I was able to convince some product manager to get to take uh, everything to uh, Android 4 to dog out. Yeah, almost a certain fault. So, going into the code, uh, so this was the biggest change that we did, that, or for me at least, that this is the biggest help that we give uh, to our app to improve uh, the clean, cleanness of the code and, and being able to work with it. And that was, we realized that all our uh, fragments were somehow dependent on data. Uh, and therefore, you know, all fragments should be stuck on data. And probably all have your own. <laughs> if you can't hear it, of course I'm talking to Savage. Maybe you can hear me. So you don't always need to supply these previews. 
Uh, for example, the error screen always has a retry button, so you can uh, easily retry the extra network which you failed or if you didn't have the network cache. Uh, the next thing was that it needs to provide all the data. Uh, and the way that the uh, primary instance can provide data is that it, uh, it can supply, the, supply an observable. Uh, and an observable is a, 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 a RX Nova a class. And uh, what it does is basically something that you can subscribe to and get the data from. So the primary instance can supply this observable, and then the primary base will use it to fetch the data. And the last thing it needs to do is to accept the data. So actually get whatever data is fetched and publish it to the user. So if you quickly look at the code, you have something that provides the layout uh, and usually just provides a, a layout <coughs> file. And then you give the data. In this case, we're looking at the discovery feed, which is one of the activities or fragments in our app. And what it actually supplies as the data would be a uh, uh, cache discovery feed. It basically has some caching mechanism built in, but it's also not observable. Uh, so it passes that back to the fragment base. And when everything is done, we accept the data in a function called update UI. Uh, and it will do generics and things like that, provided with the data that we need for the view and we can set that data. So that's a little bit what we did with the, with the, the structuring. And this made it possible to remove all loading, uh, loading logic from the fragment and made it much cleaner to what this fragment is actually doing. Uh, so I mentioned our network library before. Uh, we didn't use one, we used something called retrofit. And the reason why we used retrofit was that it's really, uh, it's really clean, it's simple to use, and it also supports our Java and servers. Uh, so the way that it works is that we provide uh, so, uh, so, uh, so you provide it with an interface to create uh, this kind of interface where you supply it with uh, an application where you have the endpoint and then uh, you have a function uh, you define a function which you can tell you. you pass that into retrofit and it creates your service for you and then you can use the service to talk to your API uh, so if you combine these things, the RX Nova and Replicate, we get something that looks like this, a lot of code. If we look at the first line here, uh, so we use our app service, uh, we do a call, uh, we ask for the retrofit for the observable, and by calling the, in this case login email, uh, we provide it by the email and password, and this will actually return the observable. So this will be done, would be done by the fragment instance. And then the fragment base, and you can in turn subscribe to that observable and wait for the data. And the way that RX Java works is that uh, it really wants to work with the function pointers. But since we don't have function pointers, you can create anonymous functions which act as function pointers. So this, in this case, we have something called action one, which is, which is just one parameter. And when that action one is uh, called, uh, we get the off response, and that would then, then we can execute a lot of logic if we want. Uh, or in, in the fragment instance and base, the fragment base will take this data and give it to the fragment instance. Uh, so the subscribe of uh, the observable, uh, you pass in first one, uh, one function pointer, and then uh, you can also listen for the error state, uh, which you should. Because if something fails, it might not only be the network call, it can be something in your, uh, your success uh, your, your service sequence. Uh, so you get a throwable instead, and then you can read that throwable uh, and see what the error was. In this case, we're a little bit lazy in just saying that the email or password is incorrect. But it can be a bunch of reasons. It can be network library or it can be something internal to the app. That's RxYO together with Replicit. And the nice thing about RxYO is that you can use it for a lot of other things. Uh, I've created a little tutorial repo if you want to see if it, how it can work. And that's what I have. What I do is I create a subject and I publish things from that subject. And then I use three different ways of subscribing to the subject to achieve different things. And in the first case, I do a normal subscribe. And you can see that it says subject.observe on. 
And what you observe on thus it is that it tells you where you want to call back. And in this case, we are modifying views in our callbacks. And as an Android developer, you probably know that you can only modify views on the main thread. So we tell RxJava, please give us the response on the main thread. And then we subscribe. Uh, and in this case, the things that are published are only strings. It's a very cold we count how many strings we get in. And we set the text view and update the count where the thing comes in. And the next way you subscribe is that we use a uh, subject of buffer. And what buffer does is that it has an argument uh, and it waits for the argument to be fulfilled before the argument is actually uh, given to the subscriber. Uh, and when that first item is given to the subscriber, all other items that came in during the time period is also, are also given to the subscriber. Um, so the difference here is we have the buffer, we say for five seconds, it waits five seconds before it dispatches anything. And then we subscribe. And now we have a different action one, or a different parameter in action one, because we will get all the aggregated items for a time period. So we will get the list of strings. And what I do with those strings is that, that I count them in a simple way, and then I update the text thing too. And the way that we use this in our app is, for example, for metric calls. Uh, we have a lot of different things that we want to do. So that we use the dust, for example, it swipes the screen, it changes the tab, it presses this button. And the way that we did it first was that for every action we had to send a call back into where the user was doing. Then we changed it to instead of sending directly to our back, then we put it on the subject, and then we subscribe to that subject uh, with a buffer of at least 10 seconds. And then, uh, so that all the metrics items were queued up, and then we dispatched all items that happened in the 10 second period. So so every 10 seconds we will send a batch of items to an instead of sending them back to an individual. Uh, and then the last subscribe, uh, something called a debounce. Uh, and it looks almost like a combination of the two before. And what debounce does is that it, when it gets an item in, it waits for a certain time period or a certain, uh, uh, certain parameter before it will send anything uh, on to the to the caller or the subscriber. And what debugs does when it gets another item in is that it just throws out the first item and it puts as a memory system. And the way that we use this is for example for like buttons. So if you have a like button and someone presses it by accident and then presses it again, we have a debug period of two seconds. And so as the user needs to stop spamming the, the like button for two seconds, then we'll send one out. So if you want to look more at that, you can look at the detailed code. If you didn't understand what these different things are, I have the app here that you can run. So if you, if you close this project and start it up, it will do this. If you start it up, it will start uh, emitting items. And the regular one was the regular subscribe. So it will just update the count with every item that comes in. Buffer will then, every five seconds, it will dispatch all the strings. So every five seconds, it will update. And debug just sits there because it gets items too quickly. And you can see I will stop there at 200. It happens, debug switches, and the buffer also gets there. So, a little bit of Java, RX Java magic, helping with simple things in the app, really simple problems. Yes. <coughs> so, we have our app. We do a lot of development, we do it very quickly, we change a lot of things, and we break things. Uh, so the question is, how do we test these things? And the main way we test things are through alpha and beta testing. We have a, we use Google Play for alpha and beta groups. So we have an alpha, which is internal for web employees. We have an open beta uh, for all external people who want to test the app. Uh, the app. Uh, so I would recommend you try that uh, in Google Play. And then as a second line of testing, uh, we use stage rollout, which is also a Google Play feature, where you can define how many people you want to roll out your app to. Uh, so we usually start by running that 10% and see if it works. If it works well, uh, we will increase the percentage. If it, if it doesn't work as well, we will replace the APK or do some kind of fix. Uh, and then gradually increase it until we get the that it works, or that we have an app that performs the way we want, 
And that way, it, we don't have to affect a lot of the usage of the bad traffic streets. And then the last thing, which is a little bit controversial, right? at least to me, and that is adding tests. And what I mean by that is that union test or uh, UI test or things like that. And everyone always talks about the testing is so great. And, and it really is. Uh, you can test core functionality and everything good. Like you have an extra safety line when you release. However, the negative part of tests is that they take a lot of time to write. And they take even more time to maintain. So I will really look at your situation and see are tests really necessary. Uh, for that, we didn't have tests for a very long time. And then we started writing some tests. And then now when we changed our strategy, uh, we actually didn't have time to update the tests. We have a lot of data in tests right now. But we, yeah, we have to rely on the alpha and beta testing uh, on the stage real at this time. But the important thing here, at least to us or to me, is that your app is easily testable. Uh, and what I mean with that uh, is that you should be able to test your app without modifying activities or fragments. So if you're testing an activity or fragment, there should be no code in that activity or fragment that hints towards the test. Uh, and the way we are able to do that or mainly is through a what we call dagger, which is a dependency injector. Uh, and the way that it works is that uh, this is two examples from the uh, from the doc. Uh, for example, you have a coffee maker, and you can then inject <coughs> different items in that coffee maker. Uh, so you, in this case, they inject a liquor and they inject a pound. And what happens is that you create that object, and then you tell dagger to inject the liquor the pound. What that does is that it will look for a definition of uh, who provides this, for example, this pump. And somewhere else in the code, we need to provide that pump. And the way that we use this in a wrap, and the wrap app is that we have, for example, the API, which creates some set of variables, or some variables that can be reused. We, uh, every, every activity or fragment that needs the API, we make the API in uh, activity, and we use something called uh, at singleton annotation, which means or tells Dagger that this uh, item will be created once, use it for every place. Uh, so we have that provides at singleton and we create, uh, provide the API. Uh, what we also use it for, together with RxJava, actually, is for accepting some ac access tokens. So we have many places, or probably around three places in the app that use access tokens. And what we do is that we inject an access token object. And what this access token object does is basically an observable for the subject from RS Java. And what happens is that if uh, every activity that uses access token will subscribe to that subject. And when someone updates that access token, all of the active places we use this access token to actually update. So a little bit of magic uh, that you can get to the really clean and simple code. Uh, so we have a dagger. I created a repo if you want to look at it. Uh, what it does is that it creates a simple activity with one text view and it makes a fake API call, uh, which I named get tweets for some reason. Uh, and this is the main activity. And uh, what it does is it has the, this uh, uh, inject annotation, so it will inject the API. And then in on create, you do something like short an application that get injectable sub get and uh, dot inject. And that will actually set my API variable. And then a little bit later, uh, further down, I use the API object tweets. And the API will now be set to an object because I did the injection. And we will set the text view to have a world. Uh, so if you look at the module, uh, this is where it specifies how, how it should be provided. So we, we have a module the annotation where you say which class should be able to inject things. And then you have a something we call API module which provides actually API. Yeah, this is somewhere else in, in that code. And then if you go to the tests, uh, you can in any test you want, and in any way you want, you can replace the API module and say, uh, that use this one instead. And then it will use the test module module. And the test module will not return the regular API, it will return the mock API for the API mock. And so now we can actually factor out the whole API. If the, the activity that we have does not know anything about it. So our test can look like this, where we 
just create an attempt, we start the main activity just as it would start uh, if the uh, app was live. And we can then look at the text you see with this and it will have the response from our mock So that was a good example about how we use Dagger and how the app can be used to tell the uh, tests. Uh, and then one last thing that I just want to mention. Uh, I've seen some examples of this today. And there is login. A lot of people do a lot of things with login. Uh, we basically could be able to only use login and standard log. Uh, and usually what you do is you create a tag for every activity. It will be nice. And then you, have, uh, you use a standard log. You supply the tag and you supply uh, whatever you want to say at that point. And that's quite a hassle, at least to me, because you have to provide this tag in every, every, uh, every place you want to log in. And, uh, and there's the code that you don't really want. Someone came up with a great idea that you can just set the tag automatically to the class name. Uh, yeah, that's great. But you still have cases where you don't want to log in production. And yeah, you should really remove your login before you send out your app. And then maybe you want to log to your analytics, or in this case, crash analytics. Um, so what we end up doing is probably with a static class, which handles all your logging. And that will work, work fine. Uh, however, there is a simpler way of doing this, which will save you a lot of time. And will do basically the heavy lifting. And there's a library called Timber, which is not really a, a library. I would say it's just a class. And what it does is it will help you with your logging. The way it works is you start by adding a tree, so it feels tree related here. Uh, and how does it wrap that is that we count different trees depending on the production or if we are in detail mode. Uh, so this tree will define where our logging message is going up. So in debug mode, we found the debug tree, is a, which is provided by Timber, and it would just, everything Timber gets, it will put on the standard logging. And if we're in production, we create something called the crash reporting tree, which is our own tree, which looks like this. Uh, so it extends timber hollow tree, where you can specify what the different uh, endings should be. So for error, we have supplied some message or some handling, and for info tags, we have supplied some handling. So in the error case, we will actually send our messages to statistics, and in the, the info case, we will send our messages to Crash it is also, but not as a woman uh, yet. And what I forgot to mention is that you do this once in your app and you do it on your uh, application on trade. So one time as early as possible, so usually in application on trade, not, not activity on trade, but application. Uh, and then when you've done this, you're done. So you can start using Timber. And you, the good thing about Timber is that it can be <coughs> one parameter and it support string the format. Uh, so you can just write your message or you write uh, like this uh, NF statement to specify it with strings into your login. So if you write this and the output that you get, so you can see to the far right, you see that it actually puts out. Amazingly it puts out testing hello. But the real magic is the part before which actually says where that login was made. Uh, so in this case, I did all of this in the main activity and, and it will pick up um, all the different classes that you want to for your own or for your testing. Yeah, that was all I had. Thank you for listening. <laughs>